digital marketing is one of the easiest ones to enter into. I like to say that digital marketing is easy to learn but hard to master. Mindful marketing, I would say, is another essential aspect of marketing. And uh, the whole premise of mindful marketing is pretty much embracing customer feedback, empathy, and then mindfulness. Change can be either good or bad, and change to humans is generally perceived as scary, especially if this change is enforced upon you, like in COVID-19 case. Uh, more often than not, people re will react negatively. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Vietnam Rising. I'm Tom, and today our guest is Wes Jackson. Tell us, what are you doing? <laughs> so uh, I am doing digital marketing here in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. And this is pretty much the place to be right now in order to be doing that because Vietnam handled COVID-19 very, very well so far. And the digital marketing industry here is in its infancy, but also exploding in terms of growth and awareness of the need for digital marketing. And so uh, that's why I, would, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else, honestly, right now in the world than right here because it feels like the center of everything. Mm. Everything's happening here mm -hmm. and big things are happening here in Vietnam. Yes, so Vietnam is rising. And that's why you should tune right into this episode. See you there. What do you think about the state in digital marketing in Vietnam right now? Uh it's in its infancy still, which is really exciting because there's a lot of innovation here. Uh because a lot of the rules are kind of being made up as we go here. Mm. So it's similar to how Uh, this country made a big jump in technology. They kind of skipped the personal computer era a little bit, a lot of it, straight to smartphones. Kind of how the digital marketing here is starting to take leaps forward. Mm. So uh, influencer marketing here is an interesting one, for example. Oh, yeah. Influencer marketing is uh, very trendy. So is digital marketing mm -hmm. because people are becoming more and more aware of it and wanting to do it as a viable job. Yes. Uh, where you can, you know, work remotely, be your own boss, all that <laughs> stuff. It's very suitable to the entrepreneurships in Vietnam. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's because the, the population here is so young and Gen Z here is very unique, like go-getters. Mm. It feels like a lot. People like you, actually, uh, there's a lot of them here. A lot of the business owners I know are very, very young mm. compared to the U.S., for example. Yes. Which is very exciting because you have all this fresh, like, brand new talent mm -hmm. and people that are just making it up as they go yeah and, and do you think it's that's exciting. a good thing because you know um being young is you have the, the advantage but you also have the disadvantage of not knowing enough yeah inexperience mm -hmm. yeah um yeah that's an interesting topic because as someone who has never really had a mentor uh doing it on your own and making it up as you go along Yeah, it is riskier and it is scarier. Do you feel like you often question yourself? Yeah, yeah. Then there's <laughs> the imposter syndrome is much stronger when you're a solo founder or a solopreneur, as they call it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is harder on your own. But I, that's why I most often actually see a lot of collaboration here. Mm. A lot of partnerships, a lot of relationship uh, marketing, honestly. Networking, very strong here. Yeah, the bonds absolutely. that you build here in business are, they seem to be much easier to build mm. and much stronger, uh, especially it's stronger. A, yeah, Do you I think like so. Stronger? I think there's the opportunity for it to be much stronger mm. uh, because here it's less of a transactional nature when you're networking. It's, it's not, you know, what can you do for me? What can I do for you? It's how can we create a win-win situation, a mutually beneficial partnership and relationship. Because a true partnership, that's someone that you can rely on mm. and they can rely on you whether or not, you know, dis despite the time of day, pretty much. Well, yes. So people are more open for collaborations and opportunities and proposals mm -hmm. of doing new innovative things. But yeah, I don't know. Like, I feel like it's also a, it's kind of like, a, what's that? Like, cowboy? Like, what's? Cowboy, Wild West. Wild West. Yeah, yeah Wild it is West. like the Wild it's West out like here. That's what Wild I tell West. everybody. Yeah. But it's also like LA combined with New York at the same time. Mm. It feels like this is the center of the world. Can kind you clarify? Of. Um, 
because Saigon itself, Ho Chi Minh City, is very, very metropolitan and cosmopolitan. It's kind of like a melting pot mm. of business, culture, and youthful energy. Yes. Uh, it, and so it's very similar to both L.A. and New York in that regard. If you just took them and combined them together, East Coast and West Coast identities, and then stirred in the Southeast Asian culture. It's very interesting. Yeah. And do you feel, well, so personally, I feel like in Vietnam, they've been able to build a brand that uh, people love, that they were just, you know, the loyalty. Do you feel like the loyalty from consumer here is higher compared to, you know, other countries? Hmm. That's a good question. Because so, for example, in regular marketing or, or like culturally mm-hmm. like um in marketing we know that the northern and the central and then south is actually having different market yeah, different perspective different. um for example so my so in the north people are tend to be loyal to one company one brand and mm-hmm. they stick to it like for generations yeah they there there are brands there that been there for like years 20 years 30 years they're not very good but they have that customer loyal base and it is passed on in generations because um, people would usually tend to use whatever the family is using mm-hmm. or whatever their friends using. And because of that, it's harder to penetrate inside that market if you're a new brand. Um, the the South is more kind of open, innovating, as you said, like melting pot. Right? They yeah. are more open to um, trying new things. They are more open to testing new apps, new applications, spreading the news. And if the brand is good, the brand is good. And then people will support it. How about the Central, though? The Central, well, Tradition. one, traditions, yes. And they would really, really invest in international school or education in general mm-hmm. because the rough conditions and weather and the living conditions in the central so people would really really heavily invested in education as a whole that's what i that's my take on mark and like the market here in vietnam yeah they are very distinct the north and the south and the central regions um but do i think that they are more loyal um no. Yeah. Mainly I'm I'm going to be talking about the south mainly here. Yes. Yeah, north and and the central, yeah, probably. Yeah. I would agree they are more loyal to brands on average than the south. Uh and that's mainly because of the the south is such a melting pot like we said. It's they really uh value novelty. So novel experiences, things new experiences. Uh, trying things for the first time, FOMO, fear of missing out. That mm. that feeling here seems very strong. There's a lot of uh, following of trends also, for example. Trends here ignite like a forest fire pretty much because they seem to happen overnight in but this city. Is it different? Because in the North, mm-hmm. even luxury brand, they can have their own explosion like iPhones that mm-hmm. will be adopted easier in the North compared to the South. Really? Well, they love branded things, right? Yeah. So branded luxury things, and I feel like the North will be easier adopting those kind of things mm-hmm. if the brand is established. Of course, a B phone or a V Smart phone, which is like a brand Vietnamese brand phone, they wouldn't take it. But iPhone mm-hmm. or Samsung or whatever, they would easily adopt it. Okay. Yeah, uh, I would agree. It is it, the power of the foreign brand name here is still very strong. Uh, what is it's interesting that you brought up the V smartphone and you know they also have scooters and cars VinFast. Yes, uh, it's very similar to China. There's a movement right now of uh, a flocking to national brands, mm. so Chinese made made in China brands, and it's I'm seeing that mirrored here in Vietnam as well. Uh, a bit, a few years behind uh-huh. China. Like people's people, going towards the like, local make? Brand? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, I do see it. I, th- I think one of the places you see it most here is uh, within the coffee industry mm. because uh, Vietnam produces so much coffee, largely Robusta, and then also uh, streetwear, actually. Yes. There's actually true. some really cool Vietnamese streetwear brands here mm-hmm. yes. that are really taking off within the last, uh, just since I got here pretty much. Yeah, in, in the last four years, I've seen a huge 
uh, movement to Vietnamese streetwear brands like mm. Five the Way, if you know them. No. No? Well, that's one of them. Uh, there's also Have Fun with the Homies. Uh-huh. Yeah. Very cool. And again, very, very, very young owners behind yes. these brands, which is very exciting because they get to kind of experiment and make it up as they go along, try new things and is see that what why, sticks. Is that why you started your own agency as well? Um, yeah, the uh, opportunity here is massive uh, and the competition kind of not so high compared mm. to the U.S. In the U.S., the actual like starting a business is much harder yes. than it is here. And it takes much longer and it takes much more in order to do it. To build a it. network, to build yeah. a business. It's much more spread out. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we've got big cities, but not like this where there's, you know, like 13 million people <laughs> all packed in one city. And then potentially 11 more yeah. in the next 10, 20 years. Ooh, yeah, <laughs> it's going to get pretty crowded. But yes. it'll be pretty exciting as more people flock to the urban areas of this country mm. because you'll see a higher and higher concentration of talent in yes. these areas. Digital marketing is one of the easiest ones to enter into. Mm. Uh, I like to say that digital marketing is easy to learn, but hard to master. Mm. So the barrier to entry is very low. Yes. Uh, and you can do it from your home and you don't have to have tons of years of experience to do it. So the age gap is also really not there. Yes. So you can do it as a, you know, 18 year old, honestly, mm -hmm. is you can get but your start. But what makes the difference between a newbie and a uh, master? Uh, the depth. So there's a concept called the T-shaped marketer. And this is something that I always recommend to students is you want to become a T-shaped anything. Any, it's not just marketer. You need to become a T-shaped person. And that's where you have a solid foundation. And so that's the top of your T. And then the bottom, the stem of the T is where you go deep on just a few areas of uh, skill sets. Yes. So for example, I'm a T-shaped marketer. I've got my foundation of digital marketing across several subjects. And then I've got deep knowledge on SEO, social media, and online advertising. Mm. And so by doing this, you become essential. You become kind of a keystone in whether it's your own company's uh, or organization as an employee or within an agency client relationship, you always want to be a T-shaped asset pretty much because then you become essential and it becomes too painful to remove you yes. pretty much because you are just so ingrained in all these areas within the organization that you become a partner. Mm. You're no longer an employee or an agency or a freelancer. You're seen as a partner. and it, the your goal whether you're an employee or a freelancer should be getting to that point and you'll know it because you'll see the signs it's when your client starts reaching out or your boss starts reaching out to you for uh, with more projects pretty much they want you to take on more responsibility because they already perceive the value they might not say it you might not get enough positive reinforcement through their words but Paying attention to their actions like that, where they want you to do more work, yes, is a sign uh, that they value your work already, and yes. they're willing to give you more uh, different types, even different projects, different contracts, mm -hmm. uh, and that's only going to that you'll find that happen more often if you become a T-shaped marketer or a T-shaped employee. <laughs> <laughs> so, from oh. us, from our producer is asking if. All marketers are yeah. liars. Are yeah. all marketers liars? Um, I think. I don't think so, right? It's like. No, of course not. But. You, if you b do believe in it, then it doesn't mean that you're lying. Yes. You're just painting the potential of the products. I think as marketers, we most often lie to ourselves. Uh, and it's most often in that respect of whether or not we actually truly believe in our client's message or the message that we're writing for our client. Uh, it's very similar to what you just said. It uh, Don't do it if you don't believe in it, because mm. it will eventually come back to bite you because you'll you'll probably burn out if you mm. don't truly believe in the work that you're doing. That leads to burnout and like midlife crises and stuff like that. I actually just told a class full of students that when I was doing my personal branding presentation. Okay. Yeah. 
if you're not if you're not true to yourself, if you lie to yourself, like which happens a lot as a marketer, if you don't really believe in your clients' products and services, you will eventually hit a wall and a point in that relationship where you kind of look up and don't want to do mm. what you're doing anymore. And I mean, uh, full disclosure, I had moments like that with uh, the international schools where I was starting to question my own uh, mm. views on international schools. I'm like, okay, do, how do I actually feel about this? Do I believe in the messages that I am helping my clients put out there? Yes. Mm -hmm. I and see. if you don't, you should really kind of stand up and let walk, your client know that mm -hmm. and respectfully walk away mm. Bef because you'll end up ruining the client relationship. Yeah. If you uh, don't believe in what you're marketing. Yes. I very agree on that. Um, I remember yeah. we have these discussions before. It's just in really intrigued to me. So mm -hmm. can you tell more for the audience? Yeah. So mindful marketing, I would say is another essential aspect of marketing and uh, the whole premise of mindful marketing is pretty much embracing customer feedback empathy and then mindfulness and so this all kind of stems from the customer first mindset first so you kind of you know customer experience yeah. this is where we take customer experience and we blend it in to the act of marketing and so uh, at the foundation of that is empathy mm. and so this is not just understanding and mm -hmm. analyzing your customer but actually, you know, as they say, putting yourself in the customer's shoes, mm. seeing through their eyes. And this is how you get to the identifying the pain points mm. and the problems of your customer the fastest Yes, is by being them. You need to become the customer and see life through their eyes. And that's how you gain understanding into the perception of your own brand. Yeah. For example. Do, um, you, do you know Among Us? You know yeah. the game? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. the game has been blowing up for the past few months. It's Among Us. It's mm -hmm. like, a, I think it's a werewolf version of a game. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. A game of deception. Yeah. So basically you're a tough two team and people will be crewmate or like the village people and then like the wolf, right? And then they will they will have to fight each other to, to win. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been taking off for a lot for the past few months mm -hmm. so what do you think that they did right there Oof, i was actually asking myself the same question because i haven't looked into it yet but okay. i wanted to analyze it because uh games are very interesting i think a lot of their strategy revolves around twitch mm -hmm. right now twitch.tv uh with, with live, live streamers stream. yes. yeah so the the games that really take off like fortnite for example they seem to have a really really strong influencer marketing strategy uh, and brand partnership management team. Yeah. So, uh, because I think most trends start from KOLs, for example. Yeah. You need, you need KOLs and people that have a lot of eyes on them, a lot of attention yeah. and uh, loyal attention as well. Uh, and the best games have all pretty much done that by dominating Twitch.tv. Mm. And I would assume that this one is no different. I'm, I'm assuming that they had a really solid influencer marketing strategy uh, behind their success. That would be my, my educated guess. I don't know <laughs> if this is correct or not, Yeah. but I'm assuming that's it. Yeah. Um, have you watched Social Dilemma? No, <laughs> but I know what it's about. <laughs> yes. So um, Social Dilemma is something, well, a Netflix documentary talking about the ethical size of social media and where it's been um, changing and manipulating people's humans behavior. So as a customer, right, you're the one who actually paying these platforms to use the advertising functions on it. Do you feel like also there's a responsible responsibility for the digital marketer to be um, ethical? Definitely. So in the, marketer customer relationship the marketer is the leader you're leading the customer towards a realization about your brand and so as a leader you are responsible for the direction of that relationship and it's up to you to you know use that power that you have over your customer wisely and responsibly so that's where the ethics comes in and into mindful marketing yeah uh, being mindful of that 
power yes uh, of that balance of power and the fact that you are the but one that's holding the most of it of Manip- like convincing someone the line yes and then manipulating to change the behavior where's the line for that um i think the line is when you make the decision to not abuse it mm. uh and to not use it to further your own ends or goals or means not having an ulterior motive of course you want the customer to buy your product yes but the ethics and the mindfulness comes into how you actually market your product. Mm. So let's say, for example, I have a toilet cleaner yes. product. Am I going to market this as like the solution to all of your problems? No. But do you see people doing that sometimes? Kinda. Uh, there's a lot of marketing techniques that are rooted in psychology, obviously, and sociology. Uh, one of them is, you know, smiling. You always see people smiling in most ads. There aren't very many sad ads besides in life insurance, I would say. Okay. (laughs) Most most advertising is uh, very positive, but some of it can also be very critical because they'll make you think that you have a problem that you don't really have. Mm. Uh, And so I think that's where you would cross the line is creating problems in your customer's mind that they don't actually have and placing your product as the solution to this problem that you have made them aware of Mm. that might not actually exist. Kind of like gaslighting your own customer. (laughs) Really? Well, well, if you talking about um, creating a niece that hasn't Mm -hmm. been aware of, Mm -hmm. Then any successful company like startups actually come from that. Like they are aware of the fact that there's a need that no one's been addressed. Like Uber or mm-hmm. Grab, that's the same thing, right? That um, you, we never think of, you know, going on someone's car and just drive. But then they find that needs and they created a market for it. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't that be uneth? Is that considered for you as unethical? No, uh, that's. Yeah, where you're staying ahead of the trend and identifying and predicting the future. Uh, that, oh, that's a good question. No, because you're solving, yeah, a need that people weren't aware of, but people were happy to accept. Hmm. That, I would say, is not unethical in mm-hmm. Uber and Grabs. Uh, there's a lot of other unethical things that they do. <laughs> but in terms of their brand positioning and marketing, I don't think it's unethical. Mm. It is solving a problem. Yeah, we weren't really aware of it, but it made sense. Uh, and they probably only were able to do that be- through probably extensive customer surveying and market research. Mm. A lot of customer research. I'm assuming they did a lot of surveys and focus groups and user uh, research user journey studies mapping out someone's life and pain points Mm. as their customer uh so i wouldn't say that they are unethical in that regard in terms of their marketing but the line is drawn in the sand where you're making up problems rather than seeing and identifying problems so okay. I mean that's when like mm. when you see a lot uh let's let's say the mm, here here I have an example yeah um skin skin care skin yeah. brightening products I was gonna go into politics but this works too <laughs> yeah that's a as a, that's a really good one you'll still see uh, ads all the time uh, advertising skin whitening cream here yes uh, because uh, it's a because, culture acceptance that uh, brighter skin is better. Mm-hmm. Well, I understand like the roots of it. Like, yes. It makes sense where it comes from. Yes. The origins of that reasoning makes complete sense. But is it still necessary today? No. No. Mm-hmm. Not so much. And yeah, that's where you're. That would be unethical, I would say. Skin whitening cream. Mm hmm. It's unethical because you are convincing someone that they have a problem. But when they shouldn't have any problem yeah, with their skin. That they should be comfortable in their own skin. And there's always going to be people who aren't. And that's okay. And I guess skin whitening cream is for that person. But, well, that's the thing. Like, if you're marketing and like, oh, if you want to be white or you want your skin to be brightened, then yes, this is a product. But if you... Um, advertising that this is the standard of beauty, mm-hmm. then that's, I think, is unethical. 
just like Instagram where yeah. um they advertising a lot about um you know unrealistic beauty standards mm-hmm. and i think that's unethical too because you make a lot of people who are normal people be envy of that look be envy of that those kind of products that makes those models mm-hmm. look like that and it's not necessary to be who you are to embrace who you really are as a person yeah definitely creating problems in your customer's mind that didn't really exist before uh bringing awareness that, that's i think the opposite of mindfulness pretty much mm. you're, you're you're twist you're taking mindfulness and like because you get to the first step where you're aware of your customers you, you understand your customer yeah but you never go past that and you don't actually appreciate them and so you use it, it's when you go in the opposite direction and start using your power mm. instead of uh sharing it it's it's all about sharing the balance of power with your customer pretty much uh and being mindful about the way that you're marketing to them. But what's interesting is there was recently a like infographic of, you know, the revenue breakdown of some of the largest American uh, technology companies. So like Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google. Mm-hmm. And so obviously with Google and Facebook, uh, Google, the a very large majority of their revenue is from ads. Mm-hmm. Facebook, it's like 90%. Wow. Yeah, which is crazy to think about. And that's why that they that's why they've essentially abandoned the platform because they've realized that oh shit, we need something else because you can't put all your eggs in one basket forever. Mm-hmm. Eventually it won't work that model. Mm-hmm. So that's why they're like trying to do if you've heard of the Libra initiative and stuff yes. like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like trying to like raise up like India's economy with like this one horribly like misguided internet initiative. Mm. They were trying to like create an internet for infrastructure in uh, India at one point huh. and they kind of turned against it. I don't honestly know the details on that. All I know is that something like that happened. I mean, that makes sense, right? If more people have access to internet, more user possibility, more people will more go people, on yeah, Facebook. More people yeah, will go exactly. on Facebook. Yep. Yeah. Which is kind of, it's like, it's, uh, that's why I don't, that's why I really don't like them is because everything they do, you know what, let's talk about the persuasion and propaganda thing. Yep. Everything Facebook does is in Facebook's own best interests. Yes. Not their users. Uh, so all that matters at the end of the day is the profit margin in their board of investors and then continuing to make more ad revenue. Because right now, as I said, that's like 90% of their entire revenue. Yes. So their only option right now in the short term is to continue to serve more ads as much as possible, yes. which requires very aggressive marketing practices mm-hmm. and, uh, then, like, and unethical mm-hmm. ones as well. Yeah, absolutely. If they don't have any screening or they don't, um, they're not able to detect which is true or false, like then people could just promote their own agenda and propaganda mm-hmm. as well. And then for if, and that takes, well, for us, like for you, it, uh, what's your advice for us as like Vietnam Rising? So I came across this um, podcast, like NAS Daily Talk. And one of the episode about good news is that good news can be converted and taken as a propaganda. Mm-hmm. Like even when you promote and you, just purposely you just want to give out good news to promote something other force our party can use those kind of content can use those kind of informations and turn into you know their own propaganda's uh tools mm-hmm. so what's your advice for us for vietnam rising to implement mindful marketing where people can see the content but it doesn't get turned to a propaganda uh, yeah, so I would just say one word, uh, objectivity. So, for example, let's take with Vietnam Rising or Viet Cetera, for example, as well. Uh, it's, you know, Viet Cetera pretty much is another um, yeah. media for v- Vietnam business in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, pretty much 99% positive news about oh. Vietnam, which is obviously great. There's so much positive happening here. But if you want to be mindful, you also have to address some of the downsides and the negatives. So yes, Vietnam is obviously rising very, very quickly and splendidly, but there are always consequences. Yes, of that's why we're earlier we said that, that white, white life here, white West here, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, when there's no rules or, yes, and then people try to put rules in, then they tend to get broken. But um, yeah, so like I'll take for example, Saigon. 
constant construction, constant production leads to air pollution. Yes. So a way of addressing that would be first you address the air pollution is an issue, Mm -hmm. but then you can address the fact that all there, there's all these Vietnamese initiatives to help remedy that. Mm. That would be a mindful approach to it. So you're not just only talking about how to make more money, yeah. how to, you know, grow from this path, but you know, neglect all the consequences. Yeah. You got to pretty much, it's about taking the whole picture into account mm. and not just the positives. And I understand like positive, positive news and positive mindset is really important, mm-hmm. but in order to be truly mindful, you have to be mindful of everything yes. that comes with that. That's Growth. why we have an episode on human trafficking from, yeah. from Vietnam. <laughs> yeah, that would, yeah, exactly. That's another um, really good topic to talk about because that's another byproduct yes. of things like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, that one is particularly interesting for sure. And right now we're the, I want to talk about the, the human trafficking. But yeah, right now we are um, the one who export. The people out right but if the imbalance of genders that will happen in vietnam well it's already happening in vietnam mm-hmm. but it's not that far yet but if it gets to the point where it's like 30 or 40 percent uh women are not an uh, you know doesn't meet enough man then yeah and then we will be the one who consume that kind of this is it's very interesting and it's and also and also, like for human trafficking, like there are people who are voluntarily participated in that system, may not or may know that they are being trafficked. I'm talking about a victim, right? Mm-hmm. And this is all because they feel like there's a sense of family, um, the sense of oh, I need to do this to support my family. This is the only way, and bad people just use it. Yeah, they they. That's it's like, very easy to. Um, influence people like that with propaganda, for example. Yes. You promise, you make promises of this better future that exists in this foreign land that they've never ever been to. Yes. And so you paint this really amazing, vivid picture of, like, let's say London, for example, with that mm-hmm. truck incident. Yes. Where all those people who yeah, die exactly. in the truck. It's that's the exact same situation. They were sold on this idea of a better future that didn't even actually exist and then they paid the ultimate price for it which is obviously really messed up and yeah. unfortunate and then they they pay money to the trafficker to yeah. get trafficked too yeah. it's not it's, like it's, it's, it's not like getting it's kidnapped. just like multi-level marketing pretty yeah. much but it's oh with gosh. human lives which is why it's even oh. more messed up <laughs> it's the, taking a very yeah, depressing intensive, dark turn <laughs> intensive example of yeah to be mindful marketing or just marketing as a powerful tool and you can see how big of a consequence it can be if you're not really doing something from your own value, what you really trust and what you really be- believe in. COVID-19 is really interesting because it it was a disrupting force in pretty much the entire world. Yes. Like everyone's life has been changed a little bit or affected a little bit in some way by COVID-19. And uh, change can be either good or bad. And change to humans is generally perceived as scary because it's different yes and it's new and especially if this change is enforced upon you like in covid 19 sake yes. uh, case uh more often than not people re- will react negatively yes. to it and people they'll kind usually of draw see in control right? yeah mm-hmm. they'll, they want control and they'll react negatively to something like this and kind of turtle uh-huh. and do the opposite of growing and then on the other hand, change is always uh, there's a there's a phrase in Game of Thrones, actually, uh, and it's chaos is a ladder. Mm. And so in times of change, like now and in times of chaos, because change is chaos. Yes. It's just difference occurring like entropy. Yes. Uh, and the key is seeing it as an opportunity mm-hmm. for movement. Pretty much. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of moving around both up, down and laterally when uh things like this happen yeah and uh the best if you want to thrive rather than just survive during this year the key is uh, perception and perceiving that Mm. realizing that you're surrounded by opportunity right now 
mm. pretty much. And what kind of opportunities have you realized in this transforming year? Um, opportunities for both personal and professional growth, mm. pretty much. Uh, thanks to COVID-19, honestly. Uh, I am obviously very fortunate to live in Vietnam in a country that was able to, so far, handle it very well. Uh, and I'm also in an industry that is exploding right now, thanks yes. to COVID-19, digital mm -hmm. marketing. So not only am I in one of the like strongest economies right now, <laughs> I am also in one of the strongest industries. And um, you have to be aware of that in the first place. Mm. <laughs> I'm going to keep going back to it, but that's mindfulness, pretty much, being yes. aware. Being aware, being grateful, would you say? Yeah, great gratitude, definitely. Mm -hmm. I'm eternally grateful that I am here right now. <laughs> and I am very lucky also that I decided to stay here mm. rather than go back to the U.S. Yes. Yeah. A lot of decisions that happened this year are going to be remembered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, For a long time. Yeah. Impactful. Mm -hmm. The Yeah, the decisions that you make in a time of crisis really do uh, determine the outcome. Yes. Um, yeah, and I, I think that it's also... Um, important to mention that you know because unfortunately you and I are we are in the positions to grow a lot but then all there are also people who are um, not that fortunate right yeah. they are getting pushed into um, employment unemployment or losing their business or losing their normal life and of course there's always opportunities but of of course there also will be, will be scared yeah. time Life but i will think knock you down yes but i think one one thing i've mentioned i think i mentioned before in the earlier podcast is that well this is what well, the war's been too worth too worse right we've been through world war we've been through war time our parents our grandparents have been through so many depressions already so covid19 is just another event another downtown but if you don't go down then how do you go up mm -hmm. right because you know the war the economy can just you know go up all the time where do you go like even the everest has none point and then you have to go down from there you know so it's, it's a challenging time, but it's also exciting. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you talked about people being pushed around. And yeah, I think it would be interesting to look at how can people in a leadership position like us raise other people up mm, yes, and help them rise as well, uh, help them see the potential in themselves that they don't. Uh, very common also like in depressed people, they it, all they see, their their mind is very negative. Uh, speaking from experience, uh, everything is negative. And all you see instead of opportunity is things that are like wrong. Yes. And it, you feel like a complete lack of control and your mind is constantly battling for it, for that control. Uh, how do we help these people uh, that are not as fortunate as we are? I think a lot of that would be guidance and leadership. So people who are in a fortunate position should turn that into a leadership position mm. uh, because, you know, losing your job is obviously a huge stressor and a huge cause of stress on yes. your life. And so people like us who we have a different form of stress, too much work, mm. but yes. it feels different, obviously, than not having anything to do and feeling like you are no longer valuable Rebel, because yes. when you, you know, you know, when you get fired or let go, that is essentially the message that is being sent to you. Mm. You were not essential enough. Uh, most people will take that very personally. Mm. Uh, but kind of like what I was saying before, it just business is business sometimes. And emotion yes. is not there a lot of the time. Yes. People, you know, when they get, they go through oh, how many people we're going to fire, then usually just looking at the numbers mm -hmm. and not like, oh, I, I know this person, they're not very good and they just have fired. Right. So um, it's unfortunate, but it's also I think it's also a lot of opportunities that people can jump into new industry like digital marketing mm -hmm. before they would never think of that. But now they have the chance to be uh, exposed to a new industry where um, not new, but a new new career path that may be better for them yeah and i think the key is because you know telling them sharing your vision with them and showing 
and talking to them about what you see in them that they can't see. It's all about, I think, the tone mm. of your message because of how when you get, you know, hit in the face by life like that and knocked down with such a negative event, such as losing your job during COVID-19, it's really hard to get back up on your own. And I think that's why people need uh, leadership now more than ever. Business mm. leadership, personal leadership, as in like coaching, for example, maybe. Mm. I think we'll see the coaching industry mm. really take off in the next couple of years, like right, right now even. Wow. Do you, are you relatively related to that? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, I was think I was pondering this concept of coaching versus leadership. Mm. Uh, I think that leader, the leaders, all leaders are coaches. Yes. But not all coaches are leaders. Mm. Uh, a leader, I think, is someone that has to wear many hats. You're not only the president the team captain, the cheerleader, also the team cheerleader, like the cheerleading captain of your company and your brand and your uh, organization. But you're also like the guide, the one that's leading everyone, like a shepherd kind of leading your flock <laughs> of sheep, not really sheep, but other people Yes. towards this vision that only you can see. Mm -hmm. The G.I. Joe. Yeah, the visionary. But... You have to help other people see that. And I think that it's the tone of the messaging. Yes. Bringing, raising up other people around you requires a supreme amount of empathy and understanding and appreciation for your like fellow man, as they say. Mm. And coaching? What, how is that different? And so coaching is obviously on a smaller scale. There's one difference. But what makes it different from leadership, I would say is I think the focus. Uh, coaching someone is developing someone pretty much. Yeah. Uh, developing their skill set or developing their personality, for example. A personal brand coach. It's all about developing something within that person. Leadership is more of, there's the, the follower leader mm. example. A coach Personalized, more personal. Yeah, more personal. Not like leading. A leader, a leader has the opportunity to become something more. Yeah, I think, mm. uh, and that's why you see a lot of like, uh, like an icon mm. or a legend or a myth. Uh. The the best leaders become like more than human. Yes, mm -hmm. pretty much. You become an idea. You like stand for a symbol or mm -hmm. something like that. It's kind of like branding as well, honestly. Mm. So the best brands are the ones that stand for something mm. and they mean something more than just the fact like Nike, let's say, mm. just do it. They, they show, associate themselves with performance and athleticism mm. and just do it. Just start, just do something. It's no longer just, you know, a shoe company mm -hmm. yes. at the end of the day, they're just cre making shoes, Yes, but their brand is so strong and filled with like story. Yeah that they've become more than just a shoe maker. Yes. You mentioned also, I think from previous conversations is um, during economic downturn, then people branding actually becomes stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Branding actually becomes even more important uh, because there was this study done during the 2008 financial recession and they looked at which brands survived and which ones didn't. All the brands that survived First off, they didn't stop advertising. They didn't, they didn't stop investing money into marketing. And they pivoted and focused on brand building uh, long term. They, they looked towards the future and realized that when an economic recession hits, it is felt for years afterwards. And so you need to have a game plan in order to survive that, a brand strategy, uh, pretty much. And uh, the best ones that survived were those that had brand building activities baked into all of their marketing during this time mm -hmm. and throughout the next like 10 years, five years, continue to invest in brand building. Uh, and in order to do that, you need to have a brand in the first place. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of, a lot of companies, you know, they have a, a brand is not just a logo and yeah. a mm -hmm. color set and a typeface. Uh, the, the brand that's honestly just like the tools of a brand. That's the physical manifestation of a brand. But 
like I mentioned before, a brand has to have a vision. It has to have a mission Mm. and it needs to stand for something. Otherwise, if you're too malleable as a brand, it's too easy to get lost, I think, Mm. in the noise. Uh, Whereas if you have a brand that stands for something and associates itself with some sort of message Mm -hmm. uh, or a movement, they'll survive because it's kind of like a a boat being carried by the tide at that point. Mm -hmm. Are you going to are you going to let the tide carry you or are you going to open your sail (laughs) pretty much uh, and catch that tailwind, which is the brand? The brand will push you uh, further than a company that doesn't have one. Do you think that, that vulner, uh, being vulnerable constantly also help? Constantly? Probably, ideally. But by being emotional, vulnerable, yeah. and open to change, to, to vulnerable. Yeah. yeah. Well, being vulnerable is very important uh, because that's how you continue to evolve, mm. I guess, in terms of your personality. You need to be open to new experiences and new people. Regardless of whether or not you actually agree with everything they say, there's you can always every time you meet somebody new, it's a learning opportunity, Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it's just learning about their life or they actually teach you something. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's uh, there's always something new to learn around you. Mm -hmm. And it's it's inside people's brains. And the only way to get that out is by interacting. Any recent vulnerable moment? Yeah, when I did my personal branding presentation, I was very vulnerable. Uh, And self-deprecating humor, where you make fun of yourself, Uh. is one of the best ways to uh, help ease the tension among everybody in that situation. Because I was very, very nervous and uncomfortable. Of sharing those kind of making um, fun of yourself? No, not the content, but the situation, I think, the setting. Uh. There was a lot of firsts during that presentation for me. And so I was... uh, starting to seize up a little bit, get a little tense and uh, winding myself up and like closing myself off. And I realized it during the presentation. This was happening like while I was presenting. Okay. And it required me to really be aware of it and then do something about it in order to prevent myself from totally bombing my presentation. (laughs) Damn, that's hard. Because like if I'm in the middle of the presentations already. And you're already doing the tailspin. I know. Like your plane is like on its way to crashing <laughs> yeah and then like you have to make jokes about yourself too oh my gosh yeah that's what I, so that's Stressful. what i did when i when i started making fun of myself uh it, it it makes people laugh and then when they laugh i loosen up and laugh a little bit yeah so i infused a lot of comedy mm-hmm. into this one because it was also with a a gen z audience which i've never spoken to before no so it's really hard because, you know, as being a young person, you never want to be feeling like you're t- being talked down to mm. or being told what to do. Yeah. So it's more of sharing a different way of seeing with uh, these, you know, young 18 to 20, early 20 somethings in a university. So I also had to tailor my presentation for that. And so I put a lot of memes in it. It's <laughs> <laughs> good. And it's again, good this is also an ESL audience. So these are people that don't speak English as a first language. Uh-huh. So tailoring, tailoring your communication to that is very difficult mm. sometimes. Seeing all the layers, trying to perceive the layers of your audience and that are very different from you. I feel like it's kind of hard too, right? Sometimes for... Um, you know, if you know the audience, sometimes you, there's so many. Yeah, that's going back to like, there are so many things that I want to say, I want to tell people that I can't really pick what to focus on. Yeah, you have to understand the before they even tell you like what they actually care about yeah. that you have to share. Because, mm-hmm. yeah, like you said, there's so many things that, you know, so many things that you like and care about that you can talk about. But it only it only matters if your target audience actually cares about it or is engaged yes. in it. Yes, I feel like that's the uh, overall topics, right? Vulnerable. Vulnerability mm-hmm. is huge, which I feel like a hypocrite sometimes because, like, I was. We had a long talk before you got here, <laughs> but <laughs> I need to be more vulnerable mm. because I do give off the wrong impression. Just like you said, mm. people also think that I'm arrogant. When well, I'm really here's the not. trick because I know how to do that a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, share the the part that you Personal. know that it will be 
that will come off vulnerable, mm-hmm. but you don't really kind of insecure about it anymore. Yeah, kind of you you already over yep. it. Then that's, that's where exactly what I am going to start doing. Mm-hmm. Is exactly what I told him. I've talked about it before, but it's just because I felt uncomfortable with it uh-huh. because I, it, you know, you got to love yourself first. Yes. In order to share yourself with other people and love other people, and so part of that, like for example, I, I guess you can say still suffer from clinical depression because it never really goes away Mm. so uh that's something that most i would say 99 percent of people here have no idea about 99.9 probably talk about mental health uh yeah i've never ever talked about it okay because you know people just like the ceo effect you know yes or the startup effect nobody sees the blood sweat and tears that went into that all they see is the end result and so it causes them to misunderstand it And so they'll think, oh, you know, this person's always been like this. It's like, no, that's not true at all. I used to be a little shy boy that, you know, was three years old and turned around during the musical performance and faced the curtain the entire time. Uh, And that person is obviously still inside of me because I'm the same person still. I've just grown and changed on top of that. Have you heard of um, Inner Child? Yeah, the inner child. My inner child just wants to play video games. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's fine but and there's some reason friends <laughs> yeah that also play video games <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm always particularly interested in that and i feel like um whenever people kind of like not themselves mm-hmm. my brain goes so far and think that that person probably has some freaking trauma in their childhood and that's mm-hmm. why they're behaving like that now you want to know something really interesting so i'm reading this book called ikigai uh, Have you ever heard of Ikigai? Yes. Yeah. It's so Japanese the, concept of like finding your purpose in yes. life, which will make you happy and also live longer. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you, as long as you, you know, maintain a very low stress level, never high. Um, so sorry, where never was I going high? with that? No, yeah. you don't want high levels of stress. A constant, very low level of stress is fine and mm-hmm. healthy actually. Yes. Because that actually keeps your mind young. Yeah. Um, but never high states of stress. It's really bad because then your uh, your body actually uh, forms an immune response and starts attacking itself. Mm. And so that's why, like, for example, burnout, you mm-hmm. know, that's obviously just stress. Yes. And so uh, stress is actually the core problem of depression also, mm. for example, because yeah. stress can stress is like the motivator of so many simple symptoms. Mm. Do like I guess stress when I'm. <laughs> not stress because <laughs> i'm like why am i not feeling stressed right well now? so that's that's the thing the key to not feeling stressed is to is having that goal and that passion mm-hmm. in your life we're not filming right now but okay <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay oh, okay so that's like an explicit version <laughs> video is not gonna have include that <laughs> yeah censored censored content um Wait, what, where, where are you going with that, Ikigai? Yeah, and so, uh, shit, where was I going with that? What were we Inner talking child. about right before that? Inner child, Ikigai. Um, I don't know why, but finding your purpose <laughs> in life pretty much is the secret to happiness. That's where you can... Oh, there we go. Because um, you're talking about the inner child and you were talking about trauma. Mm. Uh, that's very interesting because within this book, I just read a few pages this morning, and it's talking about the difference between psychoanalysis and what's called logotherapy. So psychoanalysis, you know, Sigmund Freud, stuff like that, that's obviously focused on the past. Logotherapy is focused on the future. Mm. So whereas psychoanalysis also doesn't really contain any sort of spiritual aspect to it, yeah. it really does not go hand in hand at all with any sort of faith. It's purely pretty much scientific. And it's focusing on problems more so than solutions Mm. because you're analyzing, you're trying to get to the root of this problem. Uh, I'm not saying that one is better than the other. They're two different things and they both serve their own purposes. But logotherapy is really interesting because it seems like it can be more healing. Logo is the one to look into the future. Yeah. And so, mm, I mean, I'm just trying to, I don't know. Find a reason. Let me, let me think about that for a second because i do that to myself too right um when i do something um that i feel like it's like a reactions like emotional reactions an irrational one and i will usually just sit down and try to think why mm-hmm. 
did I do that? Like, what happened? Like, why doesn't my mind or my my mind go there? Like, why doesn't my mind think that that's the right way to do it? Um, Emotional but yeah. reactions. But then I don't I don't get resent on myself because of that. Like, I just. I just, ha, huh, okay, I know why I did that. Maybe this is the reason why is I did that. Is the why always in the past for you? Um, I feel like for for irrational, emotional reactions, um, actions, then I feel like there's a root cause. And mm-hmm. by understanding that, I, I'm just more, I'm just more empathized to myself. And I'm just like, oh, okay. And I, I feel like that, that's why I use that a lot on people because I'm trying to empathize on why they're that person they are today. Because if I'm implying, like earlier we talked about, you know, have your own definitions of silence and then implying uh, other people, mm-hmm. then this is me trying to detach my personal definitions on someone else's actions and try to empathize on what kind of things that could lead them to what are we doing mm-hmm. so i think we have a great great discussion today uh, with wes so if people want to reach out to you how do they find you so you can find me on either facebook or linkedin and my username is the wes jackson and i'm happy to connect with anybody that adds me pretty much i'm pretty lenient <laughs> about adding friends on both of those platforms so i'm happy to talk with you if you reach out Mm-hmm. And what should they reach out to you for? Um, any sort of digital marketing advice, uh, self-improvement, productivity hacking, time management, task management, anything. I- I'm an optimizer, pretty much. I see data trends and then I take them and use them to change things. Mm. Uh, whether it's a person or my pivoting in my marketing, mm-hmm. I'm always optimizing. And so I analyze a lot Mm. uh yeah if you approach me and you want me to help you it will require vulnerability Mm. like we talked about on the podcast yes that's the deal yeah that's the deal i'll be vulnerable with you like Uh i have just now (laughs) you'll be vulnerable with me when you approach me for help because i'm always more than happy to give it but it requires the person to be very open to Mm -hmm. receiving it yes constructive criticism yes Absolutely. Wow. Thank you. And if you like the episode, let me let us know on the comments or email us or on all of our social media handles on Vietnam Rising Podcast at gmail.com. And thank you for tuning in and I'll see you in the next episode. And bye bye.